I'm Harriet Vance Ball at ESC 2025, and I'm delighted to have with me Professor Reuters Van Lennep, who was the EAS chairperson of the brand new ESC EAS guidelines for the management of dyslipidemias. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much. So we have had um, a really impactful uh, meeting, and your uh, group's presentation was one of them. Uh, I wonder if you would start telling us about the way uh, cardiovascular risk is categorized and according to which your dyslipidemia recommendations follow. Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for this question. And uh, of course, eh, you have to take into account this is a, a focused update of the 2019 dyslipidemia guidelines. So what we did in the process is that we specifically looked for what would significantly change the recommendations since 2019. So that is which developments in risk categorization, but also in trials, would really alter the practice. Regarding the risk categorization, uh, the main difference between the 2025 update and the 2019 guidelines is that we now are using SCORE2 and SCORE-OP which was introduced in the 2021 ESC prevention uh, guidelines. And the, the difference is that we not only look at cardiovascular mortality, but at cardiovascular events and mortality. Um, and that's, I think it's, it's really an improvement. And also that you can now um, really establish the risk better in, in elderly uh, people who are 70 or older. Um, so what we do now is that we have the very high risk population, the high risk population, and uh, well, the moderate risk population. Who you would classify as having very high risk. So you talked about the score 2 and the score 2 OP. Yes. Uh, needs a threshold of greater than 20% for 10-year risk. Beyond that, what are some of the clinical categories that we should keep in mind for classifying patients as very high risk? Okay, so if you have very high risk, then it's actually it are all patients who already uh, had a cardiovascular event. Mm -hmm. um, so they are categorized as uh, having a very high risk. And organ damage, also pa patients with severe CKD, uh, or if you have a score 2 or score 2 OP risk of more than uh, 20%, or if you have FH, familiar hypercholesterolemia, with ASCVD, or with any other uh, major risk factor. Right. And we should also talk about diabetes with cardiovascular risk factors. So in addition to having target end organ damage, I think you classified the risk factors. And this follows for, uh, from some of uh, the trials and, and the way patients were included. Then there's a high risk category of people who had um, some criteria. Would you like to tell us what the high risk category comprised? Yeah, so there are people with one single risk factor, such as having a very high cholesterol of more than 8 millimol per liter or LDL of more than 4.9 millimol per liter, and that's in milligram per deciliter. Total cholesterol of more than 310 milligrams per deciliter or LDL of more than 190 milligrams per deciliter. Or, for example, if they have very high blood pressure, above 180 over 110, or just patients with FH without any major risk factors because such in general FH is, is high risk, or patients with diabetes without target organ damage uh, and who have diabetes more than 10 years or any other risk factor, moderate CKD with an, uh, uh, who have... Uh, um, 
Dumbledore filtration rate between 30 and 59 milliliters or a calculated score 2 or score 2OP of more than 10 but less than 20 because if it's more than 20 then it's of course a very high risk. Right, and, and this guidelines also presented some of the risk modifiers that yes. we keep yes. in mind when we're classifying patients. Do you want to touch upon some of those modifiers? Yes, very much so, because that's also, I think, something. Eh? Because, of course, beyond the, the score two, there are other factors that are not among uh, those risk calculators, but will still can... Uh, upgrade the risk of a particular person. Um, so that means also, for example, p patients who have uh, high risk ethnicity, such as uh, people from South Asian uh, descent, or having a family history of premature cardiovascular disease, uh, but also, for example, having stress or social deprivation, um, but also for women now, uh, women-specific risk factors are now acknowledged as a risk enhancer, such as preeclampsia or other hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, um, having HIV, and then also biomarkers such as having a high CRP of more than 2 milligrams per deciliter or having a high LP little a uh, of more than 50 milligrams per deciliter or more than 105 nanomoles per liter. So, of course, most of us cardiologists treat people who are in the very high risk category. And I wonder for the rest of our discussion, if we could focus on this particular group, can you tell us about the treatment targets uh, for dyslipidemia in the very high risk category group? Yes, and I think that it's important also to acknowledge that from the 2019, actually for this uh, uh, very high risk, we did not change the treatment targets. Mm -hmm. However, we also have an extra category, and that's called extreme risk. And in the extreme risk group, that are, uh, for example, people who have a recurrent uh, cardiovascular events, or have a polycardiovascular uh, disease, um, those are the extreme risk. And there you can consider them to have um, uh, a treatment target of LDL less than 1.1 1 .1, uh, millibol per liter, which is less than 40 milligrams per deciliter. Sure. And for the for that very high risk category, you've left an LDL threshold of 1.4 millimoles. Is that right for titration of yes, care? exactly. So that's similar to the 2019. So that's also uh, important. That has not changed, but it's less than 1.4 mi uh, millimole per liter, or less than 50 milli 55 milligrams per deciliter. Sure. So in this very risk, high risk category, what are the sequential interventions uh, that you recommend to maintain the lipid profile under target? Yeah, uh, of course. Also, um, it's uh, it's always it's lifestyle factors as well, but then uh, also um, uh, lipid lowering uh, therapies and then still and that has not changed. Uh, statins are the cornerstone, but in this guideline, there's more focus also on uh, combination therapies, uh, especially because we know that combinations uh, work so well together. I mean, also in the blood pressure field, it's more common already to combine drugs. And here uh, it usually was, was stacking and it was a very slow process before you got your patients on, on target. But also in um, this update, we have a very, I think it's, it's a very uh, handy uh, figure. And there you can also see what kind of LDL reduction you can expect from uh, specific combinations. So you can use that to uh, yeah, sooner use combination therapy or maybe right away use combination therapy to get your patient to target. Right. So you have some recommendations around uh, moderate or high risk or high intensity statins with azetamibe, 
And then, of course, you have recommendations around PCSK9 uh, inhibitors. Who would you start a PCSK9 inhibitor in? Well, I mean, right now, and that's also uh, pragmatic, is that um, it's also uh, yeah up to the reimbursement criteria. So in most countries, at least I don't know a country that you can start species K9 inhibitor right away. So usually you will first start with azetamibe and is it uh, and and in combination with a statin. Um, but now what we say, especially also for patients with ACS, if you're not on target within six weeks, uh, uh, add a PCSK9 inhibitor or benpidoic acid um, to get your patients uh, uh, to target. Sure. Um, who? How? How about hypertriglyceridemia? Yeah, so also in that field, there has been between uh, since 2019, there have been uh, some uh, trials that has made um, either revise a recommendation or have a new recommendation. And regarding the revised recommendation, uh, there was, of course, the strength trial. And first, we had the reduced trial with Icosapent A2, which was a a pure EPA compound, and that showed that in uh, patients with moderate uh, increased uh, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, in combination with a statin, um, there you had like a yeah, huge reduction in, in uh, cardiovascular events. But in the strength trial, where they use a compound that was a mixture between DHA and EPA, you did not see that effect. And so, therefore, uh, instead of our uh, former recommendation that mentioned uh, just omega-3 PUFAs, now we specifically mention uh, to use Ecosapent ATL. Right. Um, LP little a has become very popular uh, to measure um, with limited evidence around improving clinical outcomes with specific interventions. What are your recommendations around LP little a testing and treatment? Yeah, well, uh, so there's since also since 2019, there's been so much more literature about uh, the causal uh, effect and the causal risk factor of LP little a. And of course, now we're in a very exciting period because the first trials are, are coming out. Uh, also, because we know it's a risk enhancer, which is also mentioned, well, as previously mentioned in, in this group of risk enhancers, uh, we now recommend that uh, in all patients, LP little a should be measured once. You only need to measure it once because it's either high or it's low. Um, and in that sense, you can use it as risk modifier. And that's revised from the previous 2019 recommendations where there were only specific subgroups like patients with premature cardiovascular disease, uh, um, or uh, patients who have a family history, there that you could only measure LP little a in them. And now it's much broader. Sure. Well, I am so delighted that you spent some time with us this morning going over the highlights uh, of these guideline recommendations. Thank you, Professor Roeders Van Lennep, for being with us. Thank you very much for your interest.